So there's a couple of things that we have to go over before we go further into the calibration curve series, right? And I just want to do a quick review and talk about some of the things that we've mentioned before because it's so important, but I also want to incorporate some new information too along the way. So we said that we do include zero. So a blank should always be included in the calibration curve. We should never leave that out because there's a chance that the solvent can contribute to the signal and by putting the blank in there, which should be just solvent, we can kind of help our calibration curve do what it needs to do and get better data when we analyze our samples. All right, so we do run a blank every single time and include it in the calibration curve. We also said that we have to have three minimum standards and these standards are prepared by you and you have to have a minimum of three. We said though we prefer five, right? That's the number that we're after. That way if we mess up on one, then we can go ahead and we can delete that one out of there and we still have four good standards that we can use to make a calibration curve. So we, in a way, we've went above and beyond. But what I wanna do is kind of stop here for just a second and tell you that this just depends, right? Now, no one's gonna tell you make less than three. Wherever you decide to work, wherever you decide to go, they're not going to tell you to make less than three standards. It's going to be at least three because that is the minimum across the board that you got to have. However, some companies will require you to make maybe a set of seven standards instead of five. Or some will require ten standards for the calibration curve instead of five. So that really depends on who you work for, where you work for, the type of environment, the type of samples that you're processing. All of that is very dependent on the workforce when you get to your employer in the very end, right? So all of this is dependent. I just wanted to kind of briefly mention that so that way you're not hired with a company company and they tell you to make seven and then you tell them no I'm just going to make five because that's all that Tracy told me to make is five and that's what I'm going to do because they'll fire you if you do that right so use a little bit of common sense go by what your employer wants you to do and you'll be okay but five is typically the preferred number uh, to make a, uh, on average really in all fields environmental pharmaceutical you name it it's going to be about a five all right, uh, something else that we did not mention, but again, I think that it's important for me to talk about just for a couple of minutes, uh, and this video might be completely over after that, um, is this whole concept of the standards and their concentrations. Okay, so let's say that I have a set of standards and it goes from zero to 100 part per million, and let's say that my signal from a machine and we've been using absorbance, so we'll just keep it absorbance for consistency, right? Continuity. So this absorbance value, uh, let's say for the zero goes 0 0.010 and my 100 part per million, let's say runs, and that 100 part per million is 0.843. So this is the range of the standards that I have made, right? And let's say that I plot them and sure enough, I get a straight line or at least the best way I can draw a straight line on this tablet. So that's good. You walk away and you say, hey, my calibration curve looks really good. It's linear. My R squared value, which is the correlation coefficient is close to one. I didn't have to delete any of my points. So far, sound science, right? This is good lab technique. So let's say that I then start processing my samples. And let's say that a sample that I process has an absorbance value of 1.13. As a laboratory manager, if I was put into that position, I would say, no, you're not doing it. This is not good science. And the reason is because this absorbance is higher than the highest standard that you made. So just by looking at the absorbance values, I automatically know this sample has to have a concentration that's over 100 part per million. And the reason is because the absorbance value is greater than 0.843. If the 100 part per million has an absorbance of 0.843 and my sample has a higher absorbance, then my sample has a higher concentration.
no matter how you look at it. That is not good lab technique. I cannot process samples. I cannot report samples if this is what goes on. So that's one of the things that you have to keep in mind when you're in the laboratory doing our labs or when you're in the laboratory at your employer in the future. If you are given a sample and that sample has a higher signal than your highest standard, it will not work. But you're probably going to step back and you're going to say, well, wait a minute now. This line on the calibration curve, y equals mx plus b, well, if it's truly a straight line, then you could extrapolate that data. That line represents a continuity line. That means it can go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. As far as the mathematics is concerned, it does. But our instrumentation depending on what it is, is not linear across all concentrations. I'm going to put a big star beside of that. That's pretty important. So that means when I'm at the UV Viz instrument and I'm running samples, I can only go up to a certain strength. And then after that, my instrument's going to start malfunctioning on me. It won't be able to tell the difference between the high concentrations. Atomic absorption is the same way. Another instrument that we use in a lab. If I go over to the AA instrument and I begin to run standards, then the higher I go, I have a chance of getting out of linearity. And what begins to happen is because the machines can't tell a difference between the really strong concentrated ones is that instead of a line, you begin to see somewhat of a curve that begins to happen. And this is what we call the nonlinearity part of the curve. So theoretically, mathematically, we should be able to use y equals mx plus b and we should be able to use that equation and solve an answer. And sure enough, if I can put 1.13 into this equation, I will get an answer, right? I can get one. But the question is, is it a correct answer? That's what I have to determine. Because here's the thing. At 1.13 absorbance, let's say that that's going to be here. If I used my equation and I plugged 1.13 in and it gives me an answer, it's going to give me an answer based on the extrapolated data, mathematically speaking. So my answer is going to fall somewhere right in here, right? So if I come down to the x-axis, there it is. Whatever number that is, that's what the number is. I'm just telling you a story. All right, well, if we run samples on an instrument, and let's say that this 1.13 begins to deviate from the linearity because we're such at a strong concentration that my instruments cannot distinguish the difference between the two. Well, what goes on is that at 1.13, the nonlinearity looks like it's going to have to cross the line way out here somewhere, right, if that continues on. And if I do, then this is really the concentration of the sample. They're not going to match. Sometimes you get lucky, and sometimes they do. But often than not, they're not going to match. So what am I trying to tell you? Well, first, what I'm trying to tell you is that if your sample runs over 1.13, you can't use it. Can't use it. We're going to have to fix it. For you mathematicians, you're going to argue and say, well, theoretically we can. Yes, we can. But theory is different than practicality because our instruments are not linear for infinity.
our instruments begin to deviate from the linearity and they begin to curve. Every one of them begins to give me a curvature in the calibration curve. And I have to take that in consideration. And I do not want to take the chance of my signal, whatever it is from the sample, to fall in the nonlinearity part of the curve. And because of that, I want to make sure that my sample stays within the signal range of the standards. I have to. So how can we fix it? Well, there's two things that you can do. So number one, you can weaken the sample and then rerun it. That's typically what's done most of the time. If I have a sample that I analyze in a lab and it's too high and it's higher than the highest standard that I have made, then I weaken it down and I rerun it and I see what I get at that point. The problem here is that when you do this, you have to do a calculation called a back dilution, right? Because you've weakened it. So that basically means that you're going to have to go through and you're going to have to do a dilution equation to get back to the original concentration. And we'll do an example or two of those, just so you can kind of feel comfortable with doing that process. All right, the second option that I have, if I don't want to fool with all of that extra math, I can go back to the standards. And I can make another one, but this one is going to be a higher concentration. So let's say in the beginning I go from 0 to 100 part per million. Well my samples are running higher than the 100. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to make a 200 part per million now and I'll run it. And then I'm going to have to add that to the calibration curve, which means I need to pull up the calibration curve again, make the calibration curve, include the point 200 in there and its signal, get a new regression line and a new R squared value. And I hope that my R squared value doesn't go down. I hope that it meets the linearity and it correlates with each other. And if so, then I need to reprocess all of my samples against that new Cal curve. Not just the ones that are high, but every single one of them. Now, chances are if it's good prep and everything works like it should be, when you replug your samples into the Cal curve, they will fluctuate. They will change slightly. They'll only do it a little bit. That means that your Cal curve is still in line. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say that we plug a absorbance in and we get a 50.4 part per million. Well, I make a 200 part per million and I rerun it. And let's say that with that new Cal curve, it might go to 50.5 part per million. We're still in the same ballpark. We're still in the same vicinity. That's good. But I have to process all of my samples against that new Cal curve that I've made. So there's the two options that you've got. You can weaken your samples down, rerun them, plug them back into the Cal curve, and then back dilute to find the real concentration. Or... Add another standard that's higher, run it, redo the Cal curve, and then process all the samples against that new Cal curve. All right, so in the next video, we're going to talk about nonlinearity in more detail. But now you can walk away knowing to keep an eye on your signals. Signals are higher than standards. It's not good science. Scrap it. You got to figure out how to handle it. And these are your two options.